Hello, my dears. I'm so glad to see you again. For me, presenting these tutorials is such a relaxing and happy aspect of my life. In fact, nothing makes me happier <laughs> than giving you this education. <laughs> I'm weird. As it turns out, <laughs> relaxation and happiness are very good indeed. <laughs> More specifically, their opposites, stress and depression, are bad. And in addition to being bad in and of themselves, stress and depression increase your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Psychological risk factors for epithelial ovarian cancer, specifically stress and depression. This is video number 430. It's the 18th video in the unit on epithelial ovarian cancer, and it's the 10th video on risk factors for it. Now, you're not going to find this as a standalone topic in the ovarian cancer chapter in my book. There is a standalone chapter for ovarian cancer. It's chapter 32. But this particular risk factor category is one that has been added fairly recently. It wasn't on the list of risk factors for epithelial ovarian cancer when either edition of my book was published. So be sure to keep watching this video. When you think of risk factors for cancers in general, do you focus more on physical factors or psychological factors? Do you focus more on behavioral habits or social habits? Do you focus more on your diet or on your environment? As you've seen, the vast majority of risk factors for any disease are physical, behavioral, or dietary factors. You've seen this to be the case for all the diseases we've discussed in this menopause education. Heart attack, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, endometrial uterine cancer, cervical cancer, and breast cancer. But the only disease for which you saw both stress and depression as a risk factor was Alzheimer's disease. You have seen one or another psychologically geared risk factor for various diseases. Social isolation was a risk factor for Alzheimer's and depression was a risk factor for heart attack. Beyond that, the lists of risk factors have entailed your genetics, your personal medical history, your diet and lifestyle, your body habitus, and your reproductive history. But now we have an entire category dedicated solely to psychological factors. And this category consists of two separate entities, stress and depression. Here's our big chart of risk factors for epithelial ovarian cancer. Our category for today is the very last one in a violet color. And here it is in isolation. Now, I tend to think about these two psychological states as opposites. And ultimately, I think they're caused by the same underlying entity, caring. Stress is when you care too much. Depression is when you care too little. For purposes of simplicity, I'll refer to the combination of stress and depression as the psychological risk factors. But you'll see that there's a lot more to this category than just psychological risk factors. We tend to place less importance on non-physical entities than we do on physical ones. This is partly due to the fact that we can see and quantitate physical problems. But when it comes to psychological issues, there's no way to really measure them objectively. So this category has largely been neglected in terms of research. But for people who suffer from stress or depression, psychological risk factors can carry a lot of weight. Stress is the weight of caring too 
much. Depression is the weight of caring too little. Now let's start by considering what kinds of things cause psychological stress. Would you say that most people today conduct lives that are calm and relaxing or lives that are stressful? Are your family members, friends, and acquaintances easygoing, laid back, and unpressured? Or are they uptight, high strung, and struggling to keep up? You know, I'm a person who stands back and watches people a lot, and I notice patterns of human behavior. <laughs> Mostly, I notice patterns of behavior that are common and consistent, but do not serve people well. And I wonder why it is that people continue to perpetuate patterns of behavior that are making them sick. Actually, I don't wonder about this as much as I study it. <laughs> One of my undergraduate majors was psychology. I just love psychology and I still study it both formally and informally. So I actually understand the psychological constructs that underlie maladaptive behavior patterns. What baffles me is that people either know that what they're doing is not serving them well but still continue to do it, or they don't realize that they're constantly repeating patterns that do not serve them well. Even when most of society is mimicking the same maladaptive behavior, people fail to do anything to break the cycle. One of the things to which I pay great attention to is words. I focus on the words people use. This is because words depict the emotions behind the words. For instance, I have lived on every continent except Antarctica, and I've moved to all of those different countries without knowing a soul. To me, it's a great adventure. But the most common word people use when they comment on my moving from country to country is brave. Their use of the word brave implies that for them, moving to a foreign country is scary. I don't view it as scary. So the fact that they use the word brave instead of the word thrilling <laughs> catches my attention. One of the glaringly obvious things I've noticed lately is that most people use one adjective <laughs> to describe their lives. The most common adjective people use to describe their lives is the word crazy. When I finally get in touch with a friend who has failed to respond to my call or email, the typical excuse is things have been really crazy lately. When people are looking forward to the next year or the next season or whatever's next, they commonly say next year things won't be so crazy but the next year, they are. It seems that regardless of whether they're talking about work, or their kids, or their house, or even their vacations, they describe them all as crazy. Of course, they aren't using the word crazy to mean psychologically unstable. They're using it to mean chaotic, fast-paced, disorganized, unplanned, confusing, and out of control. In essence, it means stressful. So while they use the word crazy, what they're implying is that they are stressed because they care too much about too many things. And that induces them to push themselves too much, making them feel like their lives are crazy. Well, my thought is if everything is so stressful, why don't you find a way to make it less so? Of course, I don't usually ask that. Well, actually, sometimes I do. Actually, most of the time I do. <laughs> I have no filter between my brain and my mouth, but my friends already know that, so they just laugh. But seriously, <laughs> there are many ways to reduce the stress in your life. Simply taking a few deep breaths can reduce stress. 10 minutes of meditation can reduce stress. Humming 
can reduce stress. Saying no can reduce stress. And I could go on and on. But most people don't even try to reduce their stress. In fact, they perpetuate it. But the best way to make your life less stressful is to decrease the number of things about which you care too much. It's just sad that the most common adjective for describing one's life has become the word crazy. And that brings us to depression. Depression is a very specific mental illness defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5, or DSM-5. To meet the diagnosis of major depressive disorder, you have to have at least five of eight symptoms in a two-week period of time. Those symptoms are depressed mood most of the day, every day, decreased interest or pleasure in activities, weight loss or weight gain, sluggish thoughts or movement, fatigue, feelings of worthlessness, difficulty concentrating, and suicidal thoughts. Either depressed mood or decreased interest and pleasure are mandatory requirements for qualification as major depressive disorder. But nowadays, people use the word depression to mean much less than what's required by the DSM-5. Earlier, I said that depression is when you care too little. Of course, that's not a valid definition of depression. It's really a manifestation of depression. But all these distorted definitions of depression have become so common that people who are nowhere close to being depressed consider themselves depressed. And antidepressants are the most commonly used medications worldwide. How can so many people be depressed? There used to be a social stigma associated with depression, but now it's the norm. Could it possibly be linked to the fact that people's lives are so crazy? I find it interesting that these two psychological states are really opposite of one another, caring too much and caring too little. But we're here to address stress and depression as they relate to your risk for epithelial ovarian cancer. And one of the recurrent themes in any list of risk factors is that you see one factor that typically accompanies another. No risk factor acts alone. So if you look at our list of risk factors, consider this. If you discovered that you had a genetic mutation that causes any kind of cancer, would you be psychologically stressed? Might it make you a bit depressed? If you already had a personal history of cancer, would you be stressed or depressed? If your close family member had ovarian cancer, would you feel stressed or perhaps depressed? If you discover that your ethnicity significantly increases your risk for epithelial ovarian cancer, would that cause you any stress? Could it even make you feel a bit depressed? If you'd wanted kids but never had them for reasons beyond your control, could that be a setup for stress or depression? If you have bad lifestyle habits that put you at risk for any kind of disease or cancer, might it be a source of stress or depression? If you suffer from any of the inflammatory risk factors for epithelial ovarian cancer, could that be a little stressful or depressing? The bottom line is that perhaps this separate category for stress and depression isn't separate at all. Maybe it's a culmination of a lot of other factors. And maybe it all adds up. But speaking of adding up, have you noticed how much stress or depression can increase your risk? You've seen that because epithelial ovarian cancer is inadequately researched, we do not have figures on the degree of contribution for most of the risk factors. Stress and depression certainly don't seem like priorities for research on epithelial ovarian cancer. But surprisingly, 
there are some rough figures for the degree of increased risk due to these two psychological factors. Psychological stress can increase your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer by 6 to 20 percent. Depression can increase it by 30 percent. Shocking, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm surprised at how high these statistics are. They are almost as high as some of the genetic mutations. So it turns out these psychological risk factors are really significant. So you really should care about this, but not to the point of letting it cause you stress, and not to the point of letting it get you depressed. In any case, caring too much or caring too little can both increase your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer. So let's add these statistics to our isolated category for psychological risk factors. Now, with so many women living lives dominated by stress and depression, and stress and depression having such a significant effect on your risk, it should make you wonder if the incidence of epithelial ovarian cancer is increasing. And while we really don't know the answer to that question yet, maybe this is why it's a newly recognized risk factor. So the summary is that psychological stress and depression can act independently or jointly with other risk factors to increase your risk of epithelial ovarian cancer to a significant degree. So that does it for the list of risk factors. We'll come back to the whole list in videos 432 and 433, but I promised I'd loop back to endometriosis and go into more detail on it. So that's what I will do in the next tutorial. Before then, be sure to schedule your consultation with me at menopausetaylor.me. You know it will change your life for the better forever. And don't forget to subscribe here today. Get a subscription to my YouTube channel and get a subscription to my newsletters. That way you'll get notices about all the promotions, giveaways, and special events, as well as receive educational pearls every two weeks. And I invite you to follow me on all the social media platforms. <laughs> Bye!